Hey, what's up, everybody? It's me again. It's your boy, T-Ron. That's T-E-A-R-O-N, period. And we are back with another episode of the Ubiquitous Box Podcast. Today, I'm going to switch gears a bit. Because I know, y'all know what we like to cut up. We like to laugh. We like to have a little fun. But I want to take a serious tone here for a second because I have a guest with me who is doing something I think is really phenomenal. And that is uh, focusing on the mental health of Black men. All right, and I have a guest here with me who is starting a podcast who is that is focusing on um, mental health and more importantly, the mental health of Black men, something that often gets overlooked, I think. And what better way to let you sort of get into that with my guest here today, Theo. Go ahead and introduce yourself and let people know kind of what it is you do and about your podcast as well. Thank you, sir. Well, first off, thank you for having me on. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for listening, of course. Once all, well, I'm Theo, Mr. Theo, host of the MHP Mental Health Podcast. It's a podcast about men's mental health, basically in America, because I'm American-born, so I speak about those experiences of mine, but men's mental health within this country um, and how it's we're underserved in that sector, in that that space, especially black men specifically, I feel like we're the biggest castaways, we're the biggest throwaways on um, this country already in itself likes to throw the baby out with the bathwater. And so you go into our history of the African American man and women too, they have their plight, but I'm a man, so I try to delve deep into that. The catalyst to the pod was basically I already had a YouTube channel. I was doing Regular stuff, you know, millennials and kids, we do. I was doing dumb stuff, doing sketches, making funny stuff. Um, <laughs> you gotta send me that link. <laughs> there, actually, I think I, I think I deleted most of it. There's some dumb stuff on there. Oh crap! <laughs> yeah, I'm looking horrible. But I did all the dumb stuff kids do. Thought you'd get popular. Thought you, you know, get the clout. But I left it alone because I had to get serious. I wanted to finish my bachelor, so dubbed the uh, YouTube channel. And then Eric Garner happened. And I got mad. You know, we all got mad and did the Twitter fingers thing. And I, I will admit, I left it alone too. And then George Floyd happened. And some clip, some snap. I'm like, all right, this is it. This is happening too quickly in succession back to back for us not to know that. We all know something happening is black in this country, but it's it's being, it's quite um, publicized and it's quite overt. That's the best. It's overt. It's like they're not hiding it no more. And they're letting you know these cops are going to get off. So that's a problem. So my first thought was, all right, me as a black man, there's nothing we, I, or even we could do about this government and not to be um, dark, but let's be honest, this is their country. They created it. Um, it's not on, much somebody. we can do, but don't forget lost. The Black Lives Matter movement is meant and the, uh, is worthy. They need to, they need to keep being strong. We need to support that. NAACP, we need to support that. United Negro College Fund, we need to support that. I'm not saying stop that, but what I'm saying is let's be real. Um, this is their country. They built it. They run it. There's a whole government and there's policy regulation in place to keep us under. What I had to think of is what is it that we as black men are doing on a day to day issues with us, one another, with our women, that is help keeping us degraded, keeping us in a self-destructive cycle that could lead to that moment. It's not the moment. Don't mis misconstrue me. The moment is still wrong and it needs to be rectified. I'm saying, why does the, a cop look at me as a black man and instantly he has anxiety problems? What is it about me that I'm just walking down the street with a hoodie on causes him so much despair and fear when he hasn't even spoken to me. He hasn't even seen me in, by my eyes. There's something going on. There's a stereotype. And there's something about a stereotype where it's half truth and a half embellished and bastardized truth. There are some truth to stereotypes. It has to stem from something. That's the truth. But we have to get over that and figure out where is it getting bastardized, right? So I, I was like, all right, to be honest, podcasts are getting hyped. They're getting, they're getting popular. Everyone's doing one. I said, forget it. I'm going to do one. Uh, and I was like, I had to figure out a niche. And it was that. I'm like, nobody's talking about this. Like men aren't speaking up. Me being a black man, I know we don't really talk unless it's the barbershop. We don't try to talk in front of a camera. We're not talking about emotions. So I'm like, all right, we got to destigmatize that. We got to flip that on his head so we can stop dying in the street without retribution, period. 
Mm. You know, it's so it's so funny because as you um, were explaining, you know, the motivations behind it, it's a it's a small world, and and I myself, I actually got involved with with a charity that actually goes in to do things like help with uh, with mental health, um, specifically for families who. Um, are affected because they their family member has been a victim of police brutality. Mm-hmm. So actually being able to um, go in and develop content and uh, conduct interviews and things like that with people like Eric Garner's mom and Ooh. George Floyd's family and stuff. And it's really heavy stuff because I've had to go in actually in <laughs> one of the things I do it's like I'm I'm able to go in and like you know I edit content, graphic design stuff like that, right? Mm-hmm. So when these when these interviews were coming along, it was a thing like, "Hey, T. Ryan, here's some content. We just need you to kind of go through and you know do this whole thing, right?" So I did that, but I was doing it in like large amounts. So you're talking the Eric Garner case. You're talking Tamir Rice. You're talking mm-hmm. <laughs> like just high profile cases and stuff like that, but also some some not so high profile because there are a lot of those too. Yeah. And so I was like consuming this content and going through and editing these interviews and listening to these people's stories and stuff. To the point that there were moments I was like, I have to take a break. Yeah. <laughs> I would have to get up and like walk away because you don't realize how much these things affect now not only just those um, victims and things like that, but how much it affects like black families as, as a whole. And and it is interesting to, to kind of address it at the source and kind of see what we can do to, to really be as, as ready or as I think as equipped as possible mentally, because you got to start there. Right. And I think if, I think if we start doing that, if we really start to shift the focus onto that, then, I think there is a way to to kind of go out into the world with a different um with a different mindset. Because I I mm. always say to myself, I'm like, as a black man, growing up in America is to like live your life constantly in a defensive stance all the time. Mm. Right. And and you know what I'm talking about. You you've had those moments where you go and you just go, let's say you just go into the store, right? Heaven forbid you go into the liquor store. <laughs> you know, there's levels to this shit. So anything you always got to think about. But you just riding down the street or whatever, and you could let me know if you ever had this moment, Bill, but you ride down the street and a cop car gets behind you, yeah? For sure. And the amount of, like, it could be nothing. It could be nothing. But it, but you kind of you kind of shift in your seat a little bit, or you hold the steering wheel in a different way. You're just like, oh gosh, please let them turn off to the yeah, street. You, just you, like, you sometimes even change your route to, go, <laughs> to see if, to see if you're being followed. Yeah, it's slow really down, up. slow down, get in the right <laughs> lane. Like and it's it's hard to explain that plight to people like they don't. It's like not even just white people. It, sometimes I have a hard time. Uh, um, no offense, they have. Black women have their own plight to think of, so it's hard. It's like I'm not into the whole "what was me" um, competition that we usually have. Oh yeah, no time, no time. Because if you throw all our nigga woes out there, yeah. <laughs> but sometimes I don't understand that. Like as a black man, it's like, and we got to We don't even understand that the, the gripe is is that when you having these emotions. This country is social programming that was on. So there's a social programming to men in this country to be this protector, provider, this leader, and it's like no one even talks about a feeling for. A, a male, not even just black. You can throw in any color or race. Like when you eight years old and you scratch and you start crying. Come on, it doesn't even have to be other men. It's other women too, and that's the thing that they don't get. It's like even some of y'all mothers and aunties have played towards y'all creating these so, like these um emotionally distant, disassociated men. Like we can't cry, we can't. And how do you deal with that anxiety when a cop is coming? Um, and the cop is following you, you feel that that heart sinks and your your blood is running. And he does pull you over. I say he does pull you over. Sometimes the only uh, things a men don't understand is some type of testosterone, like some type of aggression or what, or what you follow. Right. Yeah. Even when you're scared, like there's black men who are scared to death. The only thing they can understand is that that aggression because when you're growing up, listen, what are you crying for? You a man, man up. 
I can go on for days. No, seriously, like it, it's a it's a whole thing. Who had that song back? Who had that song back in? I don't want to say it was like in the two thousands. Who had that song that said they said a man ain't supposed to cry? <laughs> who was that? Song. I can't remember the artist. Yeah, it was like an R and B. It was like a I don't know. It was a really good hit. I forget who it was though. You know, it's all in the lyrics and stuff. But it's so true. Is like we we don't get we don't get that room to to express or to to share because even if something like that were to happen and you get pulled over and you get harassed or whatever and you know let's say you make it out of that situation right you go home you you don't necessarily go home and and open up or share that to get that off of you in a way that could be you know be beneficial exactly. you kind of you might go home and be like these motherfuckers pulled me over, and and that's the conversation. That's it. Yeah, because nobody's asking. Nobody's like, you know, are you okay? Um, you know, how, how do you feel about this, or um, do you need anything? Like, you know, there's the, you never actually go beyond the the stop. You never go beyond the situation. And I think that that's what happens a lot of times too. Is is we get caught up in just like the the moment, like you said, the um the occurrence of a brutal killing or whatever that happens and we don't ever get we never get beyond that you know what i mean and like and it's like you said it's so much so much back to back it's like come on i can't even i can't even catch my wind what do you how yeah. do you feel about go ahead i'm sorry no nah, i was about to say yeah but go ahead ask question no i was gonna say how do you feel about about the the addition to like just the media but also social media and how that affects black men too because you gotta think when I've probably seen so many people die on the internet, man. That yeah, because, unfortunately, especially like when um when world star hip hop became like a huge thing. Yeah, I've probably seen so many people, and, and, and to the point where it's like, oh, you kind of, you know what I mean, and, and 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 you you don't really think that that messes with you, but that shouldn't be okay. You shouldn't be used to just seeing stuff like that, you know? Yeah, like um yeah, what do you think about the how that adds to the the whole shit? I mean, it, the word I everybody's been using it, but the word's desensitizing is a thing. And even when after George Floyd happened, it's not too many that's specific about black men, I can say. Like not as in once again, like I said, as the fight is men and women, but there's not a much conversation about black men in specific, which is why I created this podcast. Like it's just been I know it's been so many of us black men and it's hard I know it may be hard, but there needs to be some conversation about legislation for black people and a lot more freedoms and the prison industrial complex is mainly about men. It's about these young black boys and I don't see much of that going on, but you do see black male bodies being wasted wasted around and i see the de- desensitized uh desensitization i see that a black male body isn't worth much these days like it's in legislation like black people in general are only three quarter three fifths of a man as they say and um it's still true to today like it happens it's happening it's happening in succession like i said too much like you had literally i think george floyd was like number 12 or 13 since uh since Trayvon happened back in 2011, if I'm not mistaken. And that's about a decade ago. I think. Right. And yes, it's just all in desensitization and um, succession. But um, I'm trying to, unfortunately for myself, I have to, I work in tech. And so I have to be on here. But what I do is um, you could do, um, not a sabbatical, but like, Kind of like a digital cleanse. Like I'm trying to go on to. Um, I tell people all the time, unplug. Yeah, because <laughs> it's a please. It, it's the Matrix. Like, so if you go back, if you've seen the movie The Matrix, and if you watch that movie again, every time they say Matrix or The Matrix, just swap out, swap that out with the internet. It's real. The internet is the Matrix. It's binary. It's ones and zeros. It can suck you in. If you're a millennial on the Gen Z. There are people who thrive and live off the internet. There are people who do not leave their house, live vicariously, literally through a screen. Like they're living like Sim system, like in a Sims game. That's what it's all about. And we're getting desensitized every day watching this stuff over and over. People are being like, hmm, 
all right, well, another black man just died. Oh, well. And I think that's how it's not just happened to us. It's happened to everybody. But what does that mean to the public, right? If you see it for the 12th time, you're going to get, you're going to send out your tweet, send out your Facebook post. You're going to repost, retweet. Oh, we all going to throw up the fist and everybody's going to hashtag BLM over and over and over. And for the next, that's going to happen for about a month and a half, maybe two months, maybe. And, uh, and then gonna, it's on to the next. <laughs> we all going to go about our lives and it's going to happen again. Now, mind you, Black, I give my hat off to Gen Z. I always do this for any time I'm talking. They really are the foot soldiers as far as Black Lives Matter go. That's putting people's feet to the fire. Putting, uh, I guess you say, grease in a hot pan, so to speak. And they're making movement. Like, they're making leeway. The next step is for, I guess, us, me as a millennial or my, my generation is to, like, try to put pen and pad and make legislation. This stuff ain't going to change. Ain't nothing going to move unless we move. Uh, policy and legislation like we gotta first we gotta attack the prison industrial complex then we gotta attack the school system this is gonna change because we gotta this is for me this is my personal viewpoint this is only gonna change we gotta start with the youth as far as this country goes they see all older black men 40s and 50s they they throw them out already they don't care about them already we gotta go in the school system and educate little black young men and boys we gotta let them know this uh, what this country really is. We gotta start being authentic and start having real conversations within us as Black people about what we should or shouldn't do. This gender war, this sex war, whatever's going on, that shit is trash. Excuse my French. We need to throw that away because we got bigger, way bigger problems. That that conversation is exhausting. I'm having on the internet, and I don't think I might just. Unfortunately, it's a part of my job, but. I got to get away. I th- I'm, I'm in a lot of groups talking to a lot of people, and it's like, y'all talking about the wrong crap. Y'all are like worried about the dumbest crap. <laughs> yeah, no, they really do. Is any anything... And, and you know what I think part of that is? Is like... I think part of the the attraction to distraction... I just made that up just now. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. A part of the, um, the attraction to distractions is that you get to break away from actually acknowledging what the fuck is going on, you know? So it's like something comes up and you're like, oh, let's talk about this. It's like, come on, this is not even what it is, you know? Like, what the f- why, why? Why are you putting that much that much on a situation that has nothing to do with the grand scheme of things? You exactly. Know I mean? And that's what the government is banking on. It's like, simp- uh, they'll simplify and repeat some stuff. And the their the basic ploy that they have is um separate divide and conquer like there's a big huge I talked to a therapist before there's a big huge it's in literally in writing and how they will separate a black family so a license a license uh LCSW licensed clinical social worker told me it's literally in a housing authority of our section eight that if you're a wife on public assistance and you live in sexual housing or you have WIC or you have, or you um, get some type of government assistance, if you stay in the housing, there are no men allowed in that home after a certain time during nighttime. Mind you, you know how, we all know how the hood go. Let's be real. I'm black. I come from the hood. Majority it's of like, oh, I got an inspection coming up. <laughs> right? Exactly. They do inspections and he got to go. <laughs> But on you the- know what? You know what? It's so fucked up. It's it's so fucked up. How? Like, okay, where where did you grow up for the most part? I'm from Hampton, Hampton, Virginia, which is right next to Newport News. Okay, okay, and I, and I grew up um, in Louisville, Kentucky, so I, I kind of been a little bit everywhere. But it's so funny that we could be in you know totally different states and totally different cities <laughs> and have. That saying we should be able to just be like, hey, <laughs> and you know exactly what I'm talking yeah. about with the inspections. <laughs> that's so how, and yeah, that's how deep shit go. Like I was about to say, it's in like that's unilateral across the country. That's why you know it because it's it, I shit you not. It's written in black and black and white on the paper. Majority we know how the hood goes. Majority of single moms, right? For whatever reason, what the black man does, I'm not. Um, going to ostracize them or give them a scapegoat. It is wrong and they should be in the home. But there is literal black and white words in the, in the whatever book, whatever registry yeah. book they have is a black, a male 
any type of male can't be in the home with the mother and the child after a certain time. It's like seven o'clock. How in the fuck you expect me to be the man everyone keeps saying I need to be when I can't be in the home and parent with or a co-parent with my my uh, child's mother after a certain time? There's no, a parent's job isn't clock in and clock out. This shit ain't nine to five. Like, I need to be there. She hits me up and calls me all the kids sick. I have to go out there and wait outside for you to bring the kid outside. I can't go in as a father and try to figure some shit out. Like, how the fuck? That's literal legislation. That's, like, that's systematic yeah, racism. No when we say systematic racism, that's what we're talking about. It's in legislation. Shit's crazy. Yeah, it's it's like the wackest shit because... When you when you have things like that in place, because they're they're subtle as shit too, so you never you never you don't you don't even have time to read through and get offended by something. You're just like, oh, okay, you're gonna act, you're gonna um help me get like assistance on some housing, but I can't be married or I can't. Facts. You know, it's dumb shit. You know, I remember like it was yesterday. I was um, I don't know. I was like eighteen or so. I don't know. It feels like a long time ago. Doesn't matter, but. <laughs> But I remember one time I was I was moving to a new city and um, I remember I called my sister. I was like, hey, I'm going to come move up there. She was like, come on, whatever. And she was like, you know, like I was, you know, like finding jobs and stuff. And she was like, she was like, hey, if, if you have trouble finding a job anytime soon, you can go over to this place and they will um, help you get like stuff like food stamps and shit like that. Oh, man. So it's the only time I ever even tried to do it. All right. But they ended up like. I remember asking about just because I was there and they had like this, this like bulletin board, if you will, with like information, all this shit. And I remember asking one of the ladies that worked there about, I think it was about like healthcare or something. And she was like, she's like, how old are you? And I said my age. And then she was like, do you have any kids? And I was like, no. And she's like, oh, don't even apply for that. I was, just, <laughs> I was just about to say, I was about to say, if you're a single black, even if you're a father, you're a single black man or even a single black father, go and try to do the same shit most women. You're not getting no assistance. You're a black man who can't get a... Because I was like, I was like, wait a minute, you mean to tell me, in my mind, I'm thinking this. I'm like, I have to bring a whole soul into this plane and then be the sole caregiver for this uh, life in order to even... Come on. It's that a plan. They have, listen, these white people have a plan. They have their forefathers. Let me say Andrew Jackson and George Washington. They've had this shit sewed up ever since they brought us over here on a boat. That's why I said there's not much we can do. They've been planning this shit since inception of this country. They got it sewed up to set, divide and conquer. You as a black man will not be in these homes after dark. You yourself as a black man. You can't, in a court system as a black man, you get no justice. You're literally on the bottom of the totem pole. That fight between black men and women in the court system, that shit is sold up towards, it's not even, we don't even have percentage. It's 100% to zero for a black man to try to get any type of legal custody over of the mom. So you can't get no custody. So you're not going to have the child. And so you damn sure ain't finna get no assistance. You better go out here and figure it out. Black men go to do what you can. It's wrong, of course. You gotta get out here and hustle though, cause you gotta you want child support after that, so you gotta pay for it. So what you gonna do? You gonna try to get a nine to five? Exactly. And it's not gonna work. Like you know what I'm saying? Let's be real. Most of these baby mothers they asking for every asking for two x, three x. What's times the actual child support? That nine to five job ain't gonna cut it. You gotta hustle, then you go to jail. Self destructive cycle, man. Like what the fuck? See, that's that bullshit. <laughs> bullshit not good for real. Um, <laughs> one I was listening to a recent episode of your uh, podcast, and see, I can't remember which one it was, so forgive me. But <laughs> but there was a discussion about um, you said that you were in the military yet? Yeah, yeah, I was. Yeah, about four years. About four years. What um, what branch were you? I was in the army. So. Because I didn't get to finish all of that. I remember that coming up and I was like in the middle of cooking. <laughs> so I'm going to go back and finish it. But I want to ask, did any of those experiences, because at, at that point, did you get like stationed out of the country and stuff? Yeah. So I, I was from Virginia, moved to Georgia, left from Georgia to go to Seattle. And then I went out. They sent me out to Korea and Japan. Did any of those experiences... What's the, word, what's the word I want to use? Exacerbate your um, 
hmm. your black American experience, experience. Like, did anything come up there where you were like, hmm. dang, I'm still a nigga? <laughs> oh man, dang. <laughs> hey, and the, and the, uh, shit, and the infamous words of, uh, was it Jay Z or Kanye? Even if you, uh, Jay Z, what's Jay Z? If you even, no, if you even a Benz, you still a nigga in a Kanye. If you even a Benz, you still a nigga in a coupe. Like, this country has it sold up. They've perpetuated and sent out a signal or a picture of us throughout the masses through airwaves, television. I remember I, the the you remember the uh the Louis Vuitton shit where they had the 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 the, the turtleneck with the real big lips that look like us. Yes, that yes. shit is out there. Like there's are people who only know black people through the picture, the Jim Crow era. That's what it was. They had a super black, tar black with big red lips, talking no grammar. There are people who literally still think of us like that. And in Asia, that's what it is. So over there, that's exactly what I experienced. Like this, like coronavirus. It's like. It's funny what's happening. That's ironic. It's happening to Asian people. But while we was, I was over there, it was like I was the walking black plague. It's like when you get on trains. I I just, the yes, walk. I've seen these videos. I've seen I'm these videos you. where they just stand, 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 stand. And I'm like, is this is this for real? This shit, that shit is hyper real. Super real. They avoid you like the plague. They look at you. They, they, and it's like white people are covert. Like they'll clutch their pearls and clutch their purse. They'll literally walk away from you. They'll literally look at you. As if like you're like Godzilla shrunk down or something like oh my god and they'll walk and look especially the old people it's really the old people let me give credit to like the young Asian people but yeah the old people it, over there did, did anybody ever want to take pictures with you because I seen that too um I not with me they didn't ask me but they took pictures of me and the old people would look and stare and point and then on the train they like scoot over or clinch up to a corner and try to get away from me or some shit but. Yeah, man, that shit is hyper true. Super true. It blows my mind. It blows my mind to like. It's like, come on. I've I've I've, I've traveled internationally, but I've never actually been to any Asian countries yet. I think that's. But probably, I, can't, I can't imagine. Yeah, I think that's probably the only place you're gonna get. It. I think it's Asia. I don't know, and I don't know what it is about Asian people. But funny enough, like I said, with the coronavirus, they get in there just do about that too because of Trump. He's like, that's the Asian virus. So now people are avoiding them. I, th- I thought that shit was funny. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the views and opinions are. <laughs> funny how God works, right? Don't mess with God's children. But... Oh, goodness. What what got you started in really um, wanting to, uh, other than the, the, um, the tragedies that kind of triggered it, what, what do you think your goal is with the podcast in terms of um, educating people about the options with mental health because I'm going to tell you, I'm, I'm one of those people and so you got to help me directly because I'm one of those people, I'm like I ain't telling these people my motherfucking business <laughs> man <laughs> ain't that the wackest shit, that's the wackest mentality and I know better, but I still be saying that too What? how do you, how do you communicate with somebody like me and say, dude <laughs> I was just about to say, because my old homies, what I would do is, I know them. I know about them. I know how they grow up, just like me. I know I can't just be like, um, just go to therapy. Um, it's a lot of uh, hyper-masculine, let's be honest, a lot of testosterone, but it's stigma. Like you said, you, you know better, like, you're young, but you've been brought up by elder, black elders who grew up in Jim Crow, who grew up in the civil rights, and it's just like, it's not real trust to talk majority. And there's a big wave of black therapists and all that, and I'm, I'm in a bunch of groups, and I talk to them a lot, but mainly in our parents' and aunts' times and grandparents' times, the majority of therapists were white. So it's like, there's no trust. We just got off being slaves about 50, 60 years ago. Why am I going to go? That's where it comes from. That's where I figured out. why. I'm, when they say that... Why am I going to go talk to someone? They instantly think a white person. They don't think, like, it's 2020. There are black, Indian, Asian therapists. They instantly uh, uh, set, like, uh, it's that that high up. And psychologists and psychiatrists is a pretty highbrow, um, elite kind of, I guess, job. It pays a lot. It charges a lot. So they instantly think white. So that's where I assume most of us are getting it from. But I was just thinking, yeah. like, to keep it real, man, I, just, and I try not to preach and get on the soapbox because I'm doing that. What I would say is, think about a therapist like your regular, and for black men, we don't go to the doctor, but think about it as like a doctor, right? You go for a regular monthly or annual checkup to check on your body to make sure you can do what you need to do. Your brain 
is even is within your body. If you gotta take care of your body, you should take care of everything in it. Your brain is inside your body. That needs to be taken care of. A regular physician or a general doctor can't take care of that. That's where the psychologists and the counselors and the psychiatrists come in. We need a regular checkup, and there's different levels. What people don't understand is it's not you going into a room and laying on a couch. Like there's levels to therapy. You can go to a counselor, in which case that's just like a person you talk to to sort things out where you're feeling flustered. If you only have problems with uh, anxiety sometimes and you can't figure life out, you just go to a counselor. You hop on a call and talk to him. Next level over that would be a therapist where you feel like you can't function, right? You feel like you can't even, I don't know, get out of bed. If you're dealing with depression or anxiety is stopping you from living life, that's where you go to therapist. Next level up from that is a psychiatrist where you actually have, well, therapists deal with mental illnesses too. But a psychiatrist just provides, subscribes um, medicine, literal medicine. I think they're, don't quote me, but I think they're the only um, part of the spectrum of therapy that can prescribe medicine legally. Um, and that's where you get a psychiatrist. If you have mental illnesses where you need drugs to help you cope or to actually live an av- quote, air quote, average life. So we don't know that stuff. That's why I need the podcast trying to let people know. Like, you don't have to go get a psychiatrist if you just, like, stressed out about a cop just pulling you over. You hop on the phone with your counselor or your licensed uh, clinical social worker and be like, man, this stuff, this has me feeling fuzzy. I'm angry and I don't know what to do. The biggest point, the biggest thing I have to go about therapy, I have to say this, is um, therapy is not an end-all, be-all. Just to let y'all know, just not to be dark. It's a constant work about you being a better human being and you trying to evolve and so it does not help it helped me i've been a there for two years straight looking for another therapist it's done nothing but help elevate my life in different ways how did you say or how did you find the resources or the tools and to be like i'm definitely going to do this therapy thing did it did someone bring it to you or was it um something that you kind of went into on your own so this is the first time I'm saying this and every other interview I didn't remember, but my mom, I don't even know how my mom, cause she's old too, but I think she figured out from a coworker. My mom sent me to therapy when I was in the fifth grade and I remember that out of nowhere and it was crazy. So I need to attest my, um, my even thought of therapy to her. She sent me to a therapist. Uh, dang, that's crazy. But, um, yeah, that time. So I guess that's kind of like in the back of my unconscious while I was okay with it. But fast forward, I was married from 2016 to 2020, and my therapist was uh, my marriage counselor with my wife. My wife quit, and I just kept going to that marriage counselor, and she just turned into my therapist because she just does marriage counseling a part of her practice. That's just one section. And so I just used her as my therapist to figure out my own problems and figure out why certain things along on my marriage was bleeding into other parts of my life while I wasn't working out. Like I felt like um, I could talk to my family, but I felt like they wasn't giving me the advice I wanted to hear, which is weird and wrong. You should take advice how it is. But I just felt like they couldn't help me in the capacity that I needed. And so she was there for me. Um, And that's how it sprung off. And that's why I'm trying to be an advocate, let let everybody know. How do you feel about these? And and this has probably um, become more popular through the pandemic as well. Have you um, heard about these apps and these uh, programs, online-based, like sliding scale options for therapy and things like that? Have you looked into that or do you you know anything about those options? Because I think those are probably going to be the most readily available options for people currently because it's at your fingertips. And there's different um, apps that have popped up where you can actually talk to, you know, licensed therapists, um, no matter where you are. And, you know, you can switch therapists, you can kind of, you know, check in anytime, stuff like that. But um, there's a few different options out there nowadays. Have you heard of any of these or what do you think about that? So I spoke, my second ever therapist I talked to, she spoke about that and I didn't look into it. She talked, well, I asked her about it and uh, I have no skin in the game. I do know about them. I haven't verified them or checked them out myself, so I can't speak on it. I'll tell you what she said. She said she said she doesn't like them because um, it's like fast food. It's like microwave therapy, and it's not good. So from what she's telling me is those ther- therapists have caseloads, and therapists that do that are essentially freelancing their free time to get extra money, and they don't have the time to really learn you 
to really uh, get into the deep, you know what I'm saying? It's like to get into your psychology to help you. Now, what I will say is, like I said, there's levels. If you need therapy or psychiatry, uh, yeah, psychiatry, I would. This is Isaiah. This is not coming from a mental health professional. Don't have a degree certificate. But um, I would say if you need, if you think you need therapy or psychiatry, I wouldn't start there. If you're just a person who needs someone to talk to as far as counseling, um, and you need somebody who has the background and the training, and you feel like that would help. Those would be fine. That's my personal, like onlinetherapy.com or something like that. I see that on Facebook yeah, all the time. Sense. I would do that. If just counseling, counseling, and someone to talk to. Go ahead and give it a shot. But for those of you who think you got real problems, go to um, psychologytoday.com. That's a website where I went to go find my therapist in my time. It's great. It's uh, it's um a lot of filters from insurance to let you know what insurance each one take, what type of practice they're in, what type of um, mental illnesses or addictions that they can cater to, where they're at, phone number, email. So psychologytoday.com. Um, there's another one with black therapists. I cannot remember. Well, if you just Google black therapist, I'm pretty sure it'll, it'll come up. Oh. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> let's uh, let's switch gears a little bit here. I know you said that you were married. That's not that's not the case anymore. Yeah, no, correct. I was uh, we got divorced a couple months ago. Are you a father as well? No, I'm not. No children. Okay. So you so you you, you gotta unscathed, not just kidding. <laughs> yo, people can't, people be yo, my therapist said that and I'm like, my therapist was like a fifty year old woman. She was like, Thank God you got a one woman. I'm like, Miss Jordan, are you for real? That's that what you took away from it. All right, cool. How 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 long have you been uh single? And if if you if so how are you um like are you dating or how do you approach that as a, as as you are today as you are um a man that's going to therapy trying to better himself how do you approach that today and then also there's the pandemic so that's going to make it harder to even do that but right. what's that been like for you i've only been officially da- i've only dated probably one girl officially since my divorce so it's been about 5 months and um she was going through something too personally and I was trying to help, and I'm um, basically in a nutshell. It's so I say after be being, I call it being therapized. After you're therapized, it's like an enlightenment. It's like the veil is um, off of your eyes, and you are not to say awake because woke. I'm tired of people saying woke, but it's like you're aware now. You have more self awareness, and it's better self accountability. That's another thing about therapy. If you have problems with self accountability, I would say go to therapy, but you're going to have a problem with therapy because the only thing the therapist does is bring up a mirror and say, hey, this is you. This is what you're doing. This is why you do it from childhood. And so I'm finding in my generation, I'm a millennial. Unfortunately, we have the internet date. So it's a lot of fake news going around. But um, for the young women that I do speak with, um, the number one issue I have is coming across people who are self accountable. Um, people who are not aware of their own trauma and PTSD and they don't even know they have a problem and aren't willing to face it and aren't even willing to figure out, you know, this may be affecting me in these ways, so I need to work on it. And there are some women, very a very uh small percentage who are aware but don't care. And that shit be killing me. It's like, do y'all not know if y'all just like read a book here or there? Or and I think with women it's like I think they think because they're naturally emotional beings because they do this whole sisterhood, like kumbaya, waiting to exhale moment with their with their sisters every now and again. <laughs> they good, like uh, because and we we shit all dudes all night and we cry, drink wine all night, and after the next morning after we get done crying, we good. Like nah, sis, you might you might want to go talk to somebody who's a professional and figure out, you know, what I'm saying why you, your judgment of character is trash. Like why you keep picking trash men? Maybe, but you know, I'm a black man, so I, I guess we should stay out of women's business, black women's business, but. From my personal, on my personal account, that's the biggest thing. People aren't self accountable. Um, people are traumatized. A lot of people have PTSD. A lot of people are just uh, hurting each other. Hurt people, hurt people. People are just slaying acid around everywhere and don't even know it. And they're sitting around wondering why I'm single and you know why I keep dating. Why this so this cycle of dating keeps going on. And I'm now I'm in it and I'm tired. Do you think that makes it harder for you to date somebody? 
like being um being therapized as you call it do you think that makes it harder because it sounds almost to me like once you have seen the light and you get that dose of clarity not woke but you're aware <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> but do you think that makes it that makes it harder to um they are makes you makes you more prone to like emphasize people's like you know issues or or do you do you feel like you zone in on it because it sounds like it sounds like almost like a vegan where they'd be like you know actually I feel great because I stopped mm-hmm. doing this <laughs> ah, I hear you <laughs> you know what cuz you know vegans they they will wear you out I, so I'm small. Is that what it's like? I, I so I tried to be vegan for a couple months, and I did. I'm proud to say I didn't do that to anyone. I did in my head. I ain't gonna lie. I'm judging people like you know they're gonna kill you. But I've, I'll admit again. So about two months, the first girl I dated around that time, I was talking to a bunch of women. I had to get over that because I have a little. And I personally, me being therapy, I say I have a little um, arrogance about myself for some things about me um, about my intellect and my intelligence and so i have delusions of grandeur sometimes and then being to therapy and reading the dsm and reading books and talking to therapists every day i realized that 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 was i did have that issue um from jump street from from starting out and i was just like opening people's shit stuff up before they even knew and it kind of made it awkward and then i'm just like telling people we're going to have you i will ask the question like have you ever been to therapy that's just like a weird question to ask somebody i thought you were sitting here yeah trying. it's a big yeah you know how we are you know, yeah. uh, you, you immediately be like, hold on, wait. <laughs> it's but it, <laughs> exactly. Like, I thought we was here saying, talk about, you know what I'm saying, where you from and what's your favorite color and shit. And I learned how to do dating. You got to like, you know what I'm saying, not smooth shit over, but like, it's levels. It's take time. You talk about certain things at the right time. And I had to learn that. And um, one thing is big is grace. That's what I had to learn from being therapy. It's like, everybody has their journey. It's going to be to their time. Now, on the flip side is, Isaiah Theo is going to not allow you to bring whatever trauma you got and not allow you to sling acid on me. That's what I can do. I'm not going to rush you. I'm not going to sit here and get on my soapbox. But what I am going to do is get my shit and uh, exit uh, left real quick because I have my own journey. I'm like, I'm not going to allow anyone to make me regress. It take, This therapy shit is not all fun and games. It's a lot of crime. It's a lot of weird thoughts, you know what I'm saying? It's a lot of anxiety. It's a lot of openness. You have to give up a lot in order to get a lot. Um and I'm not going backwards for nobody. Um but yeah I went I went I went I went through that. Um but yeah but yeah I, I went through that. I had to get over that. I had to get over myself. Um I had to really listen when I'm listening to someone, I myself am not a therapist. That's the big thing too. Is like I'm not case studying people. I'm not here to fix you. That's the other thing too. Like I'm not here to if you want me to, if we get to that point where to help you and me, you know what I'm saying, I walk your hand and give the therapy. If that's something you want to talk about. Cool. I just figured out I'm gonna stop talking about it. Really. See, that's dangerous for me because I know how I'm set up. <laughs> Let me feel like I know some shit. Yeah. Let me feel like I know some shit. And somebody say. Yeah, I don't even like doing that because I'm like, mm, well, you don't even know. The therapist said that, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yo, you, when nobody will be around me, I'm like, yeah, so you know, that even actually, that, <laughs> that even what it is, where it comes from is when you was a kid and this, this person did that. I'm it like, sounds bro. like you, it sounds like you have daddy issues. <laughs> <Like, no. laughs> oh, man, <laughs> it's a learning curve. <laughs> Oh goodness! That's see, that's dangerous. See, that's why you can't, you can't, you can't let all your cousins have access to everything because they don't, they take that shit and use it against you, man. I mean, but no, um, <laughs> it, it, am I lying? No, it's a oh, learning curve, and especially with us, as black people, like it's a learning curve. We always want to out some shit once you learn something, and then people get weird, and it's it's like a social factor for um dating and shit. But it's hard. I mean, what would you do? Think about it. Put yourself in a situation. If you know something, my thing about it is to figure out a way to talk to people. Nobody wants to hear someone on the soapbox. But think about you. If you was talking to somebody, you had some information. Let's say you and this, you and this girl or guy is walking down the street and you know for a fact around the corner somebody's standing there with a gun. What would you do? 
Oh, do oh, you want me to answer that? Yeah. yeah. What would you do? So, I mean, there'll be a few different things that would happen, right? You, you, if you're aware, you get you get cautious, or you do whatever you can to make them aware of you know what needs to be done, so that way you're not, you know, getting in a situation. So, you, if you know, you're gonna try to prevent, right? Exactly. But in conversation, if you pull that situation in a conversation, it's a way of how you do it. And then, for as men talking to women, there's already a difference in sex and gender. So the way sometimes I could talk may be a little too assertive or they may think, you know what I'm saying? I'm trying to make them feel small. I had to figure out a way to finesse that conversation and figure out like, listen, this is just what I know. It's helping me. So it could help you. But I'm I'm trying to, I'm figuring out that, look, man, people all got their walk. People got their journey. I just got to give grace. And if I if they, if they show me something, they're like, all right, they don't know that they, they got to figure that out and they not finna get me and they be a so. I'm just going to go over here or I'll go over here and let you do you, ma. See, the the adult in me knows better. And so I'll be trying to do better. But, you know, it depends on who you're talking to at the time. Because some uh, some people, <sighs> some people, <laughs> you just be like, look. <laughs> but, but, but my big thing is, whether it's um, a relationship or um, a friendship, whatever it is, if there is something that you are concerned about with another person and you think that is something that is um, affecting their, the mental health in any way. Um, it's not, it's not for you to decide. So you can't just be like, you know, Hey, don't do this or you shouldn't do that. Cause when you go, when you come at people like that, just naturally you have that moment where you're going to like, but get defensive. You're not going to mm. receive any of that. Right. Fact. So I always, I always think it's best to, to have a conversation or to present like a moment. It's like, um, it's like if you're trying to like lose weight or you're trying to maintain a diet, one of the big things you can do is you make, you carve out a time that you're going to like eat a meal mm. instead of just mindlessly snacking. So you're like watching TV and just eating a bag of chips. Cause before you know it, you ate the whole damn thing. And <laughs> And, it, it, and it's because you're not paying attention. So if you do the same thing with your relationships and your friendships and you carve out mm. the times and say, hey, we need to have a conversation about this. Um, are you free on this day? Right. And so you set up a moment and an expectation. So when something that needs to be addressed comes up, it's not nobody feels blindsided because it's like, hey, I want to talk to you about this thing that's bothering me or that I'm concerned about. Then you, you know, then everybody's in the mood for it. Right. Mm. And then another thing is like, if it, because it, like I said, depends on who you're talking to. So sometimes the situations don't come up like that. Some people don't give you a, a moment to set up a time with them or set up a, um, an occurrence with them. So you have to wait for the opportunity to present itself. So if you're dealing with that kind of person, it's the kind of person that's usually more um, narcissistic. <laughs> So they're not going to necessarily ask how you feel. They're going to like um, dump shit on you. And, and, you know, in those moments, it's that's when you're like, okay, hey, like, especially like if it's people like that are causing problems or they're involved in a lot of drama mm. and they always bring it to your table, you know, bring it to you and you're like, in your back of your head, you're like, but every time it's you, <laughs> you're the common denominator. Come on. And it's like, how do you how do you say that to them, right? So with people like that, I think the best approach is like when they come to you and they're like, Yeah, I had an argument with so and so, you know, we got in another altercation and she did this to my stuff, and it was all and then at, at that moment it's like, Do you feel like you know, and, then, and you just say to I feel like you are adding to this too you just let them know then because those people you have to be a bit more frank with because mm. <laughs> they're never gonna have give you the moment to do that right so you have to create it in in the just as it goes and then i think that the biggest thing in a healthy relationship is to mention the thing like talk about whatever an issue is and leave it I know people kind of try to chip away at stuff over and over and over again, but the reason I say that is because it's like, I'd rather say something to you and be like, you know, not to say I told you so, but to, but to more so let you not be able to come around to me and say, 
well, why didn't you tell me? Mm. And it's like, no, nigga, I did tell you that <laughs> that was a problem. I may not have repeated myself and said it over and over again because I'm not going to do that with you. Mm. you, you <laughs> but I said it so that you, so, so you could talk to your other friends about why they didn't say shit. I'm yeah. telling you, this is a problem and you got to correct it. Now, you may not feel what I'm saying, but you could never tell me that I didn't bring it to you, you know? Yeah. So, you know, I, just, well, those are my those are my takes. A little that sounded a little close to home right there. The little you got a little emphasis right there. It seems we all have that one friend or one person we care about. The, the relationship person always coming to talk to you about oh why well, these girls doing this, these men doing that, and it's like this this it sounds unilateral. It sounds like your judgment of character is trash. So how about you look at yourself and figure out why you're picking trash right. people? But you can't tell them like that like that. You can't even, for some people that I figured out, you can't even itch to tell them how, you know what I'm saying, maybe you need to change the things you like or your interests because those same interests, people like, it's those kind of people like, I don't know, I haven't figured out, I, I'm not going to lie, being therapy, I haven't figured out how to tell people that because it just doesn't, I, it's never come across well, I mean, for me. I, mean, I think um, I think the, the best approach, and this is just my opinion, but it feels right. It feels right to me. So I'm going to share it. I think the best approach with anything that you're going to give advice on or want to discuss is I think it's always to share what works for you and then let let someone else decide if that's something that they want to try. Because what works for me might, you know, if you try that, it might kill you, mm. you know? So you don't necessarily have to do what I do, but I but I want to at least share with you what works for me, so that way, maybe through that you can find something that works for you. I mean, I think that's the best approach overall. What do you think? I th- Does that I, sound good? I've had, I think I've had, for now that I think about it, my therapist told me that about, about that by my ex-wife. She's like, when you had a conversation, you one or two things, you want to attack the problem, not the person, and then yeah, I think she said something to that effect. That exactly what you said. It's like. You just need to have a conversation to let the other person figure it out from so let them come up with the answer themselves as you talk. Just you know what I'm saying? Ask questions. Be like, what do you think about well, how'd that make you feel? Or why'd that make you feel that way? Who what did he do? What's that? What's he like? Things of that nature. So you're right. It's just it's hard for me to practice because people could come at you, come at you with the same problem, and you get frustrated. Like, bro, this is like female woman number eight. You talking about the same one, it's like you're not getting it, fam. Like Duh, yeah, I, I'm I'm legit the friend that will be like, if, if you calling me or texting me, let it be about something else because I will not entertain. <laughs> if I, especially after we, if we've had the conversation already, I, I try my best to not entertain it after the fact, especially if it's just the same thing. It's like, come the it. fuck on, you must like it. Yeah, you must like that shit. <laughs> you just like a planet too. Yeah. <laughs> you, <laughs> Don't get me started. Before, before we um, wrap here, I, I want to try to do something. I want to try to do a thing. And maybe since you have kind of started to take your journey towards bettering your mental health, what are some things you think as Black men we could do daily? Because I think a lot of times what translates over for us is something tangible. Right, mm-hmm. a lot of times black men need something in their hands to to last, so we know it's real. Mm, that's a fact. <laughs> like, you know, you you, you can work for the check all fucking week, but it, that shit don't resonate till you got it in your hand. You're like, okay, let me see what the fuck y'all took out. Mm. <laughs> what do you think? Like, if you had a name, like, I don't know, three things, maybe five things, three to five things that you could do daily whether it be affirmations or um exercise um you know whatever it could be what do you think what's something you've tried that could work for you to kind of help you get clarity before you start your day and what do you think uh could work for the listeners what is, what's some stuff you think we could try hmm. to take steps towards bettering our mental health facts all right so i'm gonna okay so i'm gonna say what i do and as i talk i know as it's like i'm a black man i know black man i know you're gonna think this shit corny but i'm telling you as i say it these are things i literally did i can't fabricate none of this i have had a therapist so this is literally what i do i have a self-care day that's usually sunday or saturday 
So the first three things I'm going to say, I try, I do every morning. So when I wake up, after I get done, shit, shower, shave, eat, uh, sometimes, this is what I do. I have a yoga routine, a five-step yoga routine that I do where I'm playing meditation music. So sometimes it's ocean, just the water and the waves. I like that. Or sometimes it's like Tibetan uh, meditation music. After I get done with those five yoga exercises, I keep playing the music. I sit on my couch. Me, I sit Indian style. I sit on my couch and I meditate for at least 14 or to 15 minutes. Um, all while I'm like either burning sage or I'm a, I do aromatherapy. So I have essential oils like being sprayed. After that, I do have affirmations on the wall that I've written down. I usually say those aloud, try Monday through Friday. Sometimes it don't happen, but I say that. Also part of my self-care, self-care, what will happen on Saturday, Sunday is I will exercise. I get a mani and pedi. I get a massage and then I meditate and then I work out. So if my cheat day will be probably on my self-care day and I do that in succession, I try to do that every weekend. And then those top three steps, if you can remember, if you wrote it down, I do those Monday through Friday and that keeps me balanced. You know what I'm saying? Um, try something like that. I read books. My therapist tells me therap- th- uh, help, help, ugh, self-help books. And I keep a journal. So when I read and write things down that resonate, I write that thing down and I read it. I try. I'm not going to see it in a lot of y'all. I've read it. I haven't read it in two to three months, but a couple of weeks ago, I did read it and it gave me some enlightenment. Um, do that. Um, two books I'll give y'all is How We Love. It's a white book. So a white and red book you can get off Amazon. And the other one is called Boundaries. So that's a big book that almost every therapist, especially if you're in marriage, will give you. It's a white book with a pencil writing down on a piece of uh, paper, drawing down. I forget the authors, but Boundaries on How We Love. Look up those two books. Um, start to read them. It'll jumpstart. It should jumpstart you very, um, very far in your uh, mental health journey. Man, that's corn. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I already know the black man's like, what is this talking about, man? This is talk, man. I'm wrong with therapy and get my nails done. Fuck here, out of here. here here's, here's, a, here's, a good, here's a big thing I think that would that a lot of a lot of us could could do. Because like like I said before, what works for me might kill you. So these are just um ideas, but you wanna start somewhere and kind of explore what works best for you, right? Mm-hmm. But one thing I think it works across the board is um is working out like Fact. physically working out number one as black men if we work out who looks better than us like no. <laughs> yeah, come on now. just on that law, I mean come on it's just it's just there but anyhow um so there's that but and that uh, I think that could be a good one because that is um something that is easily done but also you feel good physically and that translates over to your mental health very very much so because Hundred percent. You get res- you know you get results. You you get things that you can like work toward it, that you set goals. So you could you know say hey I'm gonna do this many push ups this week, this many sit ups this week, whatever it is. And those things are those are your moments. I think those are the times you can take to to just have you and your focus and kind of escape you know the harsh realities that come day to day for us. But um, I think that will translate over. But a thing that you mentioned that I think sh- should Carry over to every fucking body, especially black men. Listen, get you a motherfucking mani and pedi, especially <laughs> get your feet a pedi. Get especially a pedi because there's a lot of black men who are who have missed out because they think it's corny, they think it's gay, they think Miss, it's whatever. The yeah. Fuck. Yeah, man, listen, get that hard shit off your feet. Fellas, like, <laughs> it, if, any, if any fellas are listening and you claim... It change your life. Look, it's it a, change your life. And it feels good, too. That's the thing they don't get. Like, 
Sometimes <laughs> some of the some of the women are a little harsh, but that man, massage. I ain't doing that. Come on, man. that <laughs> massage be feeling that massage and that hot wax they put in the back. Like that should be feeling. I be and I be feel like a king. Like you getting treated. I feel like a king when I'm sitting down. Like come on, man. That shit, fellas. Get that hard shit off the heels, fellas. Bro. Get that fungus yeah. in between your toes. Get that fungus in between your toenail. And if your you swear, it's not supposed to be that color. I promise. Promise you, <laughs> you that you will, fellas. You will get more attention on the beach when you have your feet done for women than not. I'm telling you, having your nails done. I've had women after I get it done. I get that clear coat shit. I'm I'm just chilling. I'm fundling with like money or something at the door. She's like, oh shit, you get your nails done. That shit cute. I'm like, I know, fellas. I'm telling you, man. Take care of yourself. God dang. <laughs> <laughs> now that's just that's just me being silly, but I'm dead ass at the same time. Mm-hmm. But, um, before we go here, Theo Isaiah, let people know where they can find the podcast, where they can find you, and yeah, and the like. So thank you, I appreciate the opportunity. Um, so I'm on YouTube. I'm on every digital service platform. Um, the big three: Spotify, Google, and uh. Apple Podcasts, but um, I'm on Anchor, I'm on Squadcast, I think it is. Uh, you could look me up as Miss Mr. Theo or M. H. P. Um, there's a link. Uh, when you go to my YouTube, there's probably a link in the description of every video where there's a link tree where there's the official um Instagram. There's my Instagram. I don't like to pull any arms if you want to go find it out and go get your healing, fellas, and go get some information and elevate your life. I implore you to do so, but start your journey wherever you can. If you are lazy and you don't feel like looking everything up, I'll put links in the show notes for everybody, okay? And as of course, you all know who I am, if you've been listening to me and keeping up with me for this long. And that's T-Ron, it's T-A-R-O-N, period. You can find me on social media at T-Ron World. But you can follow the podcast too, because that's where we post all this good shit, all this good content with all our amazing guests. That's at Ubiquitous Blacks. And I tell you all the time, it sounds complicated. If you go onto Google and you type that in, even if you misspell it, Google will be like, did you mean? And then you click on that. That's us. That's me. That's you. Mm. That's us. That's we. I always encourage you, make sure that you um, like, share, review, rate, all that good stuff. And most importantly, send in questions. I have an email set up. Chubiquitousblacks at gmail.com. Send in your questions. Send in your ideas. Whether you just want to say hey, whatever it is. And we'll air them on the show. Yeah? Whether you are black in Newark, New Jersey. Or whether you're black and in Atlanta. Remember this, y'all. We, we are black, are black everywhere. everywhere. Bet. <laughs> hey, Thank you. <laughs> think I got it. Thank you so much for the opportunity, man. It was an amazing time. Hopefully, I think I got that spot on. You know what I'm saying? I should. I should. Do radio. I think you did. I I think think you know what I'm saying? I should do radio. Maybe. Maybe I should have a podcast. Yeah. But thank you so much I'm for having sure. me, man. Thank you for the time and the space and the opportunity to talk about this. Um, you do a great show, man. You do pretty good at it too. It's amazing. Thank you. Hey, thank you. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. And that's what we need more of, too. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> All right. I'm out. I'll talk to you all soon.